Um, this is the cardiac surgery presentation, um, which we've just revamped recently. As of when we used to do this, it was sort of all about weekend working um, with a little bit of on call stuff. Um, but obviously now we're not expecting you to work on the unit at the weekend. It's more about call outs. Um, so we will try and talk more about specific stuff that you will see on call. But to sort of understand what you might see on call, I am going to go through um, sort of types of surgeries and things. So just shout up at any point if you've got any questions or you can just wait till the end and we can chat about stuff together. Um, let's just see if it'll let me. Okay, so let's just check. Yeah, it's letting me do it. So aims of the session. Um, some of you will be new to this, the cardiac stuff, but for some of you, it will just be a refresher of you, your cardiac knowledge. Um, don't worry if it's new to you. If it is new to you and some of this stuff just doesn't make sense, then um, you can get in touch with me and we can book in to do some shadowing together, um, which obviously puts things into context a little bit more um, if you want to come and work on the unit. We're just going to understand what is the normal pathway for a cardiac patient. So I think probably to understand what what is abnormal um, and what maybe will cause problems, it's good to understand what is normal. Um, we want to understand the common problems for cardiac surgery. Um, and just to be aware of the cautions and contraindications that we might come across. There isn't many, but it's we need to know them. Um, and hopefully we can just pull together some of the, the information that we've gone through with some case studies. And I suppose the ultimate aim of the session is to come away feeling a bit more prepared for on-call situations. Um, so just a bit of a summary there on the content slide of what we're going to go through. I won't read them out because we are just going to run through it. Um, so types of surgeries that you might come across on, on cardiac surgery. So some abbreviations here. So um, cabbage or um, coronary artery bypass grafts. So you can have acute versus elective and we'll go into this a little bit more in a second on another slide. Valve replacements and then a few abbreviations there for the, the different valves. So aortic valve replacement, mitral valve replacement, tricuspid valve replacement, um, valve repairs but not as common as replacements. Aortic surgery which literally encompasses any sort of aortic surgery really. Um, so we'll touch on um, aortic dissections, but I suppose your aorta is obviously a big structure. So it can be anything from um, your aortic valve, your aortic root into the ascending and into the arch um, for cardiac. Um, we're gonna talk, touch just a little bit on adult congenital surgery, um, as we do have some patients who have um, congenital heart conditions that come through our system who have had um, obviously born with a congenital heart defect that have had surgery um, as a paediatric and then often they'll come back to us for either redo surgery or further surgery um, they are probably not the people you're going to get called out to I'd say so we'll just touch on that and then we will just touch a little bit again on aortic dissections um, which is slightly different to sort of standard aortic surgery as it's something that's unplanned um, and the patients can be quite sick following an aortic dissection, which so we'll touch on that as well. Um, so obviously there's lots of different types of surgeries. I suppose the main thing really to know is what's actually, what, what do we actually need to know and what's important about a patient that's undergoing cardiac surgery? Um, it doesn't, not that it doesn't matter, but it doesn't really matter what they've had done. I suppose the main thing is, is that they've all sort of gone through the same um, process of having surgery so they've all been sedated they've all been intubated they've all been um, on some sort of mechanical ventilation which obviously all of those three are things that can lead to sort of pulmonary complications um, and actually you know some patients tend to be okay um, and often it's the higher risk patients who've got um, sort of risk factors associated that will end up with problems. Um, stenotomy, so for those of you that don't know, people that undergo cardiac surgery, um, oh, someone's trying to join. Let's see if I can admit them, yeah. Um, for people that don't know, a stenotomy is essentially the opening of the sternum surgically. So unlike um, sort of stuff that's done in the cath labs, 
PCIs, TAVIs and things that are done percutaneously, open heart surgery obviously involves opening the chest. So they literally cut down the sternum and open the chest that way. So as you can imagine, this is a pretty big source of pain um, and often gives us a lot of problems post-op. You might see patients wearing a chest brace as well. Um, and it's also just to be aware of sternal precautions. So we'll just run through quickly some of the sternal precautions, which aren't massively relevant to on-call. This is probably more relevant for sort of rehabbing and sort of approaching patients to discharge. Um, but one of the main things is sternum, obviously it's a bone, it's going to take time to heal. So we say it, it can take anywhere between six and 12 weeks to heal fully. Um, what we don't want is to cause any sort of um, breakdown of the sternum um, and sort of prevent it healing. So we want to avoid any unilateral weight bearing. Um, so no shearing forces really that are going to sort of disturb the healing of it. So simply we don't like um, walking sticks. We don't like crutches. Um, you know, often we say to people don't carry anything heavier than half a kettle full as a bit of a general guide. My favorite one is don't walk um, dogs on leads. <laughs> um, obviously this isn't going to be hugely important for on call. Um, hopefully your patient's not going to be doing any vigorous activity on call. Um, certainly patients can push up from the bed, um, you know, they can do the stairs or the stair rail. We just want to avoid anything sort of really sort of shearing forces on the sternum. Um, coronary, um, cardiopulmonary bypass, sorry. So again, people might not have come across um, CPB, but basically everyone that undergoes heart surgery um, basically goes on an artificial heart lung machine, um, which circulates the blood throughout the body whilst bypassing the heart and lungs. So allowing the surgeons to fully operate on the heart without it obviously pumping blood. Um, the blood's cooled, so it's cooled to 28 to 32 degrees. Um, and this is just to slow down the body's metabolic rate and decrease decrease its demand for oxygen um oh, yeah, with right. cpb there is just an increased risk associated with this um of, sub um, of subsequent cerebral yes, dysfunction yeah. obviously the longer the brain is is cooled the the sort of the higher the risk um and there's also a little bit of a risk as they're sort of connecting and or disconnecting from the bypass um that little mini clots could be thrown off so there is a risk of um sort of strokes Obviously, it's one of the risks that they get told about sort of prior to surgery. And obviously, you know, it doesn't happen to many people, but it is a risk and it does happen. Um, so it is just worth keeping an eye on. Again, for on call, it's not probably hugely important. You, you know, you're not going to be neurologically assessing someone and working out whether they've had a stroke on call, um, but it's just worth noting. As well, everybody comes back with chest strains. So um, it's not unusual for patients to have sort of anywhere between two and four chest strains. Um, and one of the things is that they're always high risk of developing new authorities when they're removed. And um, so the main thing is, which we'll come on to a bit later, is just always checking the chest x ray, the latest chest x ray, to make sure that you're happy that there isn't a pneumothorax before you do anything, certainly positive pressure wise. Um, the good thing about our cardiac surgery patients is that they always have a good series of x-rays. There's always x-rays to compare to. Um, and again, pain-wise, a bit like the stenotomy, the chest strains are normally a fairly big source of pain, I'd say, which again, when we talk about problems post-surgery, we'll talk about pain. Um, so types of surgery, we've got um, coronary artery bypass graft, which we said. So essentially, this is pretty much what it says on the tin. It's bypassing a coronary artery. So um, used to treat coronary artery disease. Um, gold standard, really, for this. Obviously, patients sometimes undergo um, PCI in the cath lab, so percutaneous coronary intervention, which is obviously a lot less risky um, Percutaneous coronary interventions obviously done sort of, I think, I think it can be done under local anaesthetic, they can be awake, um, sort of for your higher risk patients, whereas bypass grafts, obviously, you need to be sedated on bypass um, on a ventilator. So obviously, it's a lot riskier, um, but it is the gold standard if you're wanting to fully, um, you know, fully treat 
blocked arteries essentially so what you'll find is that they'll get a graft um a vein graft um from somewhere else in the body low sometimes it's upper limb or sometimes it's lower limb um again doesn't really matter to us there's no sort of contraindications with that sometimes patients just complain of pain from where they've taken the graft from but there's nothing specific with that um, patients can have a, n a number of grafts as well we might find that some patients just have one um bypass graft and some patients can have up to five bypass grafts um, and again it just depends on on how severe the the, the ischemic heart disease is really um, they can also just be they can also be elective or acute as well so again it doesn't really change our management or sort of the, how we treat them sometimes they'll be written as um, elective graphs and sometimes they'll be written as acute the difference is really is that if they're elective you know they've been known to have ischemic heart disease they'll be under surveillance but well enough to stay at home and sort of symptom managing with GTN spray if they're getting angina um, but sort of going about the day-to-day -day life at home really whereas the acute patients tend to be a little bit more unwell um, and might have been admitted through um, through cardiology with sort of an acute chest pain and then been found to have um, blocked arteries and then sort of referred for, through to the, through the surgical pathway that way but aren't well enough to go home so often we find that some patients have maybe been in hospital for a short while prior to to having surgery which again not necessarily for on call but certainly we often find that they're quite deconditioned certainly if they've been in for a few weeks waiting for um a theatre date whereas the elective ones you know they might have been you know at home walking the dog right up you know doing sort of gentle stuff but they might have been functioning fairly well up until coming into hospital for their operation um again that different type of surgery but doesn't really matter to us too much but valve valve disorders this window thing is coming up in the, on the screen again now i don't know why yeah um valve disorders so a little slide about that so you can have a few different valve disorders so you can have stenosis valves and um, valves that have got regurgitation so stenosis obviously is narrowing so you're not going to be allowing the blood to flow through the valve properly um, and then regurg is obviously the other way so it's completely leaking valve so instead of closing off nicely and allowing that the the direction of the blood flow to be obviously in the right direction the valve isn't going to close off properly and the blood's going to regurgitate back through the valve and end up with backlogs of, of blood and sort of um, distension of, of, of the chambers of the heart sort of overfilling as well. Um, when they do valve surgery, they can do a, diff a couple of different types of valve replacements. So they can do either a tissue valve or a mechanical valve. And again, it doesn't really matter to us too much. Um, you just might see it written as either sort of, say it's an aortic valve replacement, you might see it as TAVR or MAVR, and the T or the M is just tissue or mechanical. Um, the only, I think the surgeons tend to discuss it with the patients and they sort of have a bit of a say sometimes in, in what they want, but I think ultimately it is up to the surgeon. The main thing really about them is, if you have a mechanical valve, you just need lifelong anticoagulation. Obviously it's a metal foreign object that has been placed into your body that obviously is going to be a, ri a risk of, of clotting whereas a tissue valve obviously just sort of blends in with your normal tissue so it doesn't necessarily need anticoagulation so sometimes we find that um some older people who are met or sort of people who are at risk of falls possibly um avoiding mechanical valves if they're needing anticoagulation that might put them at risk of bleeds if, if they were to fall for instance um Again, just to familiarise you really with what you might come across if you get called in so it doesn't seem completely alien to you, but not necessarily going to change our physio management, but just to familiarise you really. Um, we'll touch just a little bit on the congenital surgery. So obviously, all this, you know, the, the bypass grafts and the valves and things are stuff that people acquire over time. They're problems that, you know, you're not born with it. It's an acquired cardiac condition, whereas... Um, Congenital patients, obviously, they're born with heart defects. Um, there are honestly <laughs> just probably not hundreds, but lots and lots and lots of different congenital conditions, um, which I must admit, every time we get a con congenital patient, they're different to the congenital patient we might have had the previous week. Um, they've all sort of got their own 
unique um, cardiac plumbing, I would say. Um, there are some common congenital conditions. So tetralogy of fallows is one, if anyone's ever interested to have a look. Um, and there's, there are a few sort of common things, but generally everybody's different. So the main thing about the congenital patients is sort of just knowing what their normal anatomy is. And often there's diagrams in the notes or there's quite clear sort of um, descriptions of what their plumbing's like. You know, they might have um, a hole between the ventricles, meaning they've got mixing of arterial and, um, sorry, oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. You know, everybody's different. So it's just worth knowing what their anatomy is because actually that might impact on what their normal SATs levels are. You know, some I've come in before um, in the day and actually someone's had SATs of 80 and it's not, the monitor's not been alarming and that's because that's normal for them because they function with mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood because they've had this chronic hole between the ventricles um, and actually that's normal for them. Um, and obviously we just need to treat them differently. We don't need to be whacking oxygen up. Um, sometimes they use low pressure on the ventilator to preserve cardiac output because as we know, positive pressure um, can can drop blood pressure, can't it? And that's that's as a result of dropping cardiac output. Um, and it's just to be cautious with positive pressure, really. I think like any situation, there isn't really a, a right and a wrong. And I think certainly with the congenitals, I would always discuss it. Even in the day, I would always discuss it with the medical team that are on because, yeah, like I say, every patient's different and it's probably just having worth having a conversation about what are the risks, you know, I would probably I, I would probably go as far to say as I don't know that patient you know what's going on with that patient card cardiac wise um and actually seek advice from them they'll be able to, to tell you whether something's sort of high risk or not and you can decide whether or not your physio intervention is absolutely appropriate um and based on risk versus benefit really you know if they've absolutely got a complete collapse and if you don't treat them, they're going to be ventilated, then probably that's a, you know, a risk versus benefit argument that we're going to come out on, on the good side of. But I suppose it's just have, worth having those conversations. Um, often deconditioned, yeah, especially if, if they've sort of got chronically low SATs and um, sort of, yeah, chronic, yeah, chronically low SATs and sort of live with um, funny plumbing, let's say. Um, may have little reserve and may have longer recovery times. These aren't the sorts of patients I would say that you're going to get called out to. We do get congenital patients that come in sort of week every week um, who actually are really straightforward and they know like they they normally know the condition better than we do. They've been living with it. Often they're working. They've got kids. Um, they've probably had multiple surgeries in the past. They're sort of used to the process of it. Um, it's sort of only very it's very rarely I would say that we get a complex congenital um and when we do it's very much MDT discussion really about what we're doing from a physio management with them but they're not really the sorts of patients that you get called out to I would say it's more the sort of um yeah the, the graphs and the and the valves and generally the ones who've got risk factors that end up developing post op complications which we'll come on to just a little bit about type A dissection. Um, I'll just talk around this really more than anything. So unlike a lot of our other cardiac surgery patients who have either come in sort of electively or sort of semi-electively acutely, type A dissection patients come in um, sort of in an emergency situation. It's not something that's planned. It's not something that generally they are aware of. Um, when we talk about type A dissections, we're talking about a dissection um, of the aorta and it's classified, a type A is classified anything from the root, so anything from the valve, the root, into the ascending aorta and the arch um, and just into the descending aorta, whereas a type B is the descending aorta. Cardiac surgeons deal with anything type A, so anything sort of um, proximal um, ascending aorta and vascular surgeons deal with anything type B. Um, often the type Bs are just managed conservatively unless they're really severe. 
nine times out of ten, I would say I've seen them just be managed conservatively with just really strict blood con blood, blood, blood pressure control, keeping them um, sort of at a, a limit of, of systolic blood pressure or a MAP limit. Normally they're on um, IV antihypertensives, um, labetalol, etc., and oral antihypertensives, whereas the type A dissections, they are the patients that come through A&E, they've got raging back pain, raging chest pain, often, you know, looking pretty grey, clammy, sweaty. Um, and if they normally, they'll do a bedside echo, identify the um, type A dissection on the echo, get them around to CT, confirm that it's a, di a dissection, then everything on the theatre list will be cancelled and they'll go straight into the theatre to have um, a repair. So they'll undergo the same surgical procedure as the other cardiac surgery. So obviously go on to cardiopulmonary bypass, have a stenotomy, all the rest of it. Um, normally they're in theatre for an awful long time um, and on bypass for an awful long time. So the risks of being on bypass for a long time come along with the type A dissection. And obviously sort of, being on a ventilator and sedated, they're normally pro, you know, have prolonged ventilation and sedation um, normally for a good few days. Um, they normally just basically take out the bit of the um, aorta that's dissected. So when we say dissected, it's basically a tear in the lining of the aorta, which is obviously going to result in reduced blood flow um, to other organs. Because um, obviously, you know, your aorta is the main um, artery, isn't it? And the main blood vessel that supplies pretty much everything in your body. And you've got all the little branches that come off um, that supply all your organs. So if you think about if it was to dissect sort of right from the root all the way into the arch, into the ascending and the arch and down into the descending, actually, it could end up taking off your renal arteries, which mean you're going to have ischemia to your, um, your, your kidneys. Um, often we have patients who end up with hypoxic brain injuries because if it's taken out the cerebral arteries they've ended up having um, hypoperfusion to, to the head um, so it's, it's not unusual for these patients to be quite severely impaired really um, sort of the patients that tend to come in with type A dissections are you sort of maybe undiagnosed hypertension uh, hypertensive sorry um, sort of smokers or patients that have got connective tissue disorders so things like your Marfan syndrome or I can never say it Elos Danos um, often those sorts of patients are known to have obviously those conditions and are often under surveillance for things like dilated aortic roots but it can happen um, often those patients as well actually the the Elos Danos and the Marfans particularly, if they're known to have dilated aortic roots that are at risk of rupturing or dissecting, they'll often electively um, do a root replacement before it gets to the point where they, they rupture. Um, but certainly, certainly the undiagnosed hypertensives, I would say, sort of that sort of um, group of patients. I think the main thing for these patients is often unlike the elective ones they do tend to stay sedated and ventilated for a lot longer period often they're quite cardiovascularly unstable often they've got sort of unknown neurology and they need obviously a bit more of an assessment on the wake up um and just the risks associated with with prolonged bypass really um and i suppose like anything cardiovascularly unstable would just mean just to be cautious with positive pressure um, and I really wish there was like a, a cut off to say don't do positive pressure if they're on this much support but there isn't really and I guess it's just all about weighing up the risk versus benefit and I think Lindsay said in her talk you know on ICU there's always an anaesthetist around um, even overnight there's always a red on call so you know you're never trying to make this decision about what you're doing by yourself like it's always a, a, a discussion I would say um, especially because it's the first time you'll have met that patient probably um, so just to give you a bit of an idea about what we normally do um, in the day to see these patients I really don't know why this blooming things there um, so just to touch on it, so what we normally do um, in the daytime is we see patients depending on risk factor, um, on risk factors. And what we do is we look at pre-op risk factors, intra-op and post-op risk factors or post-op complications. Um, and we sort of classify our patients as to whether we think they're going to be um, 
high risk for developing post-op pulmonary complications. So often, um, you, well, you, you might get called in and you might find that they've been seen during the day, but they've sort of been deemed as being low risk for developing post-op pulmonary complications. And we tend to just monitor those patients through handover. It's not unusual for some of the patients to, to sort of um, bounce back almost. And even though during the day they looked okay on paper for us, um, sometimes we're not we don't get it right and they do end up developing problems so if you we do read in the notes oh you know they were seen today and they, you know they've not got any problems sort of thing they've, the physio said that they're going to monitor them you know it, it, it I wouldn't say it's common but it does happen so if you read that and you think what you know what are they on about we, we do we do screen our patients um so just to sort of yeah to say that really and what what we do is we look at pre-op risk factors which is everything that you'd really you'd think about if if you were thinking about someone that was at risk of respiratory problems post-operatively so um it just says about being over 80 which again for on call isn't isn't relevant but we do just review everybody over 80 just because um they've had major surgery and Obviously, they are potentially going to be people that live alone and possibly have pre-existing mobility condition, mobility problems, sorry. Um, but that, again, that's not relevant for on-call. Pulmonary disease. So obviously, your COPD, your bronchiectasis, your pulmonary fibrosis, any sort of pre-existing post-pulmonary disease is going to mean that they are just obviously in that high-risk category for having problems after they've had general anaesthetic, they've been sedated, you know, they've had the chest open, all the rest of it. BMI, um, high or low, I think often or, or more often than not, it's the higher BMI patients that cause us problems. Obviously, patients with big abdomens pushing up um, when their ability to deep breathe because of sort of pain and general anaesthetic. Um, anyway, it's not going not gonna to end well. Smoking, obviously, um, massive risk factor. Um, and we normally say anyone that's stopped smoking within the last, it said eight weeks, I think we say six to eight weeks. Um, I think Anna done a little bit of research in her um, master's, which is where that's come from. Um, mobility issues again and falls. Intra-op risk factors that we look at. So we've touched a little bit on um, CPB time. Um, and generally, we look at the CPB time when we see our patients day one post-op and just to see how long it's how long they've been on bypass for and whether we not, whether we think that's going to cause us any problems um, sort of progressing the patient. A little bit like how long's a piece of string. We work off 120 minutes. Um, obviously, it's all relative. If someone's had um, one bypass graft, that's not going to take as long as someone that's had three bypass grafts and two valve replacements or someone that's had complex aortic surgery. So it is all relative. I think the main thing about bypass is um, if cardiopulmonary bypass ends up um, sort of prolonging the recovery or sort of throwing them on, off what we call the normal pathway, then it becomes clinically significant. But we'll talk about the normal pathway. Um, bleeding requiring re So again, often patients come back from theatre and they find that they're sort of bleeding um, and when we say bleeding in the chest somewhere they've got chest drains in and they might have really high drain output from the from the chest drains which potentially might mean there's a bleeding source um, so it's not unusual for them to rush them back to theatre reopen the chest sort of stabilize the bleeding um, which again for us it's just going to slow their recovery down because in a minute you'll see what what's normal so going back to theatre throws a bit of a spanner in the works Cardiovascular instability, um, we'll touch on balloon pump in a minute, but again, that's going to sort of slow them down because they're not going to be able to mobilise. Ventilation issues, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? And a type A dissection. And again, we always see the type A dissection patients because they're just so variable, I think, and they can just have so many different problems depending on how severe it is. And then we look at post-op, which is obviously what's in front of us. Um, so... We look to see if they're on any more than four litres of oxygen, because if they are, that's not normal, is it? You know, yes, they've had major surgery, but they shouldn't have any new respiratory problems. So if they're requiring more than four litres of oxygen, we tend to pick them up. Um, and if they've obviously got any sort of um, evidence of any lobular collapse on chest X-ray, which is obviously quite common. Um, and certainly if they're ventilated for more than 24 hours, because, again, 
when we look at the normal pathway, we'll, we'll acknowledge that that's, that's not normal for these patients. Um, and again, not being able to mobilise is quite a big thing for us because when we look again at the normal pathway, we'll see that we like to be up and out of bed day one. So having something in situ that's going to stop us from being able to mobilise obviously is significant. Um, so we'll just quickly run through this because I'm aware that this probably isn't massively relevant. Um, but again, it's it's sort of good to know what is normal. So just to, to run through it, obviously they come back day zero. We don't see them on that day. They sort of remain sedated and ventilated. And then after a couple of hours of stability, they start to warm them up. Because obviously, remember, they've been cooled right down in theatre um, and then wake them up and wean them from the ventilator. Day one is when we get involved. So sort of morning of day one, we'll have a look at them. We'll sort of look at that screening, um, all the screening stuff to see where they stand. Um, hopefully they've been extubated. They should just be on standard oxygen therapy. Um, the chest drains that they've got in, as long as they're draining um, minimal and they've done the job, they should be removed. Um, PA catheter should be removed if they've got one, but again, we can touch on that. And then the most important thing for us is they should be sitting out of bed day one. So um, the nursing staff are really good on cardiacs and they're really proactive. They will sit the patient out, obviously, unless we've sort of flagged up that they need support with that because they're a falls risk or they've got, you know, pre-existing conditions. Um, and again, mobilising on the spot. So if you ever come on to cardiacs, everyone's always sat out in the chair and marching on the spot. Um, they'll start to wean down the cardiovascular support and actually if they are suitable they can step down to the Hobbs Bay um, on Ward 16 on day one which is is really good and it's really improved the throughput of, of patients um, day one really um, you, you know you have to be you have to be on standard oxygen therapy um, off all your cardiovascular support um, and sort of be looking good enough to go but you can go up day one if you're still there on day two, um, one of the drugs, dopamine, they'll start to wean off, which you can go up to Hobbs on that. Um, it's one of the inotropes. Um, again, lines and catheter remove. And then if you've not gone up towards 16 already, look to step down. Day three to four, once you're on the ward, sort of starting to progress independence, really. And we really push um, sort of patients getting dressed into their own pyjamas, you know, walking to the toilet, starting to get washed and dressed, that sort of stuff. Um, and then on day four, everyone will have ECG, chest X-ray, bloods, um, removal of what we have on there called pacing wires. Um, and then actually, if, if you're looking good and you've not had any problems between day five and seven, you can actually be aiming to go home. So that just really shows if you're sort of on the, what we call the normal pathway post cardiac surgery, it can be really straightforward and you can be home within a week. So that's just, always worth bearing in mind when sort of somebody isn't doing very well because you can see sort of what this you know how, how they're supposed to be doing and actually how they're not doing um just touch uh, on a couple of the sort of more specific stuff that we see on cardiac which again if you've not seen this sort of stuff then please come and shadow um obviously we can't just magic this stuff up when we're shadowing but we can certainly chat through stuff in a bit more detail or hopefully get a patient who's got some of this sort of stuff so balloon pumps um basically a balloon pump intraaortic balloon pump is a, like a, is an intervention probably is the first thing i'll say um and it's a balloon um that's like attached to, attached to a console which we've got a picture of in a second um and it sits in the descending aorta um two to three centimeters below the subclavian artery and it, so it's inserted into the left or the right femoral artery. So up into the femoral artery and sits the in the descending aorta. And it inflates and deflates during um, diastole and systole. And it's basically counter pulses with the ECG cycle. This is a little laptop thing. You can't miss it. You'll never, you know, if you walk to the end of the patient's bed and you see something like this, that is what, that's, that's what it is. It's a balloon pump. And it's, it's used really for, the main thing is for left ventricular failure. Um, so often patients, if they're in acute um, cardiogenic shock or they struggle to come off the bypass at the end of surgery um, and they've got low output syndrome, and what it does really is it improves, improves coronary, coronary perfusion 
So when we say coronary perfusion, obviously we mean heart, you know, perfusion of the heart. Um, it increases oxygen supply to the myocardium. It reduces afterload um, of the left ventricle um, and afterload um, being the force, of, the force which the ventricle contracts against. Um, it decreases myocardial O2 demand, decreases cardiac workload and increases cardiac output. The main things for us to know, we don't need to know the massive ins and outs for it. First thing that I'd be thinking if I saw a patient with a balloon pump is, is probably they're needing that because their heart's not working, the left ventricle is probably not pumping as well as it should be, and they're needing additional support than just cardiovascular drugs. Um, so the first thing that springs to my mind is how cardiovascular stable is this patient? I wouldn't just run away and not touch them with a barge pole, but I think I would probably think about things a little bit more. Um, Things to be aware of are when a patient's got a balloon pump in, they've got like two set. Well, they'll have the normal set of ECG leads that is obviously connected up to the um, the observation machine with the ECG. Then they'll have a second set of ECG leads, which is connected to the balloon pump, which is how the balloon pump knows when to inflate and deflate. So if you're auscultating, you know, normally if, if you're auscultating and an ECG lead sort of sticker comes off, then you don't normally bat an eyelid, do you? And you just pop it back on. Um, don't worry about it, but it might just make the balloon pump a bit aggy and stop it from inflating and deflating. Don't worry about it, just pop it back on. Um, but if the balloon pump starts to make a noise, then just check all your ECG leads are, are on if you certainly if, if you've moved the patient or if you've auscultated. Um, the other thing to be aware of is if, is if is the patient can't sit up beyond 45 degrees. Um, and this is just because of where, where it sits, basically. So if you think about it's going into your leg, into your femoral artery, um, and obviously over your hip joint. So as you hip flex, the risk of kinking the catheter, and it just interrupts the balloon inflation and deflation. Um, we say 45 degrees. It will depend on the size of your patient. Certainly, if you've got a larger patient, you might hit sort of the point of where it doesn't like it a bit sooner certainly if you're sort of getting that compression um, of the catheter and again just cautious use of positive pressure um, as always with with cardiovascular instability it might be that the balloon is is still in but actually they're planning to take it out you know they've weaned them off a lot of their other cardiovascular drugs and from a cardio cardiovascular stability point of view they're actually all right like with anything, just always consult bedside nurse, you know, nurse in charge, medical team, and just say, I think I'm going to, you know, I really want to do some positive pressure with this patient. Um, you know, I know they've got a balloon pump in. Um, what do you think about me doing this? And have, you know, have a conversation about it, explain the reasons why you're wanting to do it. Um, and again, if you think that that's the right treatment for that patient and it's going to make a difference, certainly if the primary problem at that point is a respiratory issue, you've been called into them, you know, stick stick to your guns and have a good conversation about it um, and always just get the anaesthetist to stay around if you if you want to whilst you're treating them. Patients with balloon pumps can be awake, you know, they can be self-ventilating, they can be they can be ventilated. So the positive pressure that you're going to do with them could be anything, it could be bagging them, it could be recruitment through the ventilator it could be birding them it could be clear weighing them um it, it just depends um when they're taking the balloon pump out normally they'll wean it so normally um it, they, don't, they sort of they stay in for anywhere between it says 24 to 48 hours here sometimes they can stay in for longer i have seen them stay in for up to a week by which point the patient's been staring at the ceiling for a week and is going stir crazy um, but they can, they can stay in for a little bit longer. Um, obviously, we're always pushing for them to come out as soon as possible because it's stopping us from mobilising the patient, which massively puts them at risk of developing problems. Um, but when they, when they do decide they're going to take it out, they'll tend to wean it. So they'll wean it from a one-to-one -one ratio. So the balloon is literally inflating, deflating with every beat to one to two. So it's only doing it every one to two beats. Um, the main thing really is, once they've taken it out, it needs compression on the side because obviously it's coming out of a major artery. So the risk of bleeding is, is obviously quite high. So compression for 15 to 20 minutes at the site, and then they normally put um, this like clamp thing on called a fem stop. Um, and then 
they have to be they can sit up then in bed there's no restriction on sort of um, hip flexion and they can sit up but they have to be um on bed rest or semi-recumbent for six six hours after um so obviously for us certainly in the daytime if they say they're going to take the balloon pump out we're like come on hurry up um so I suppose if you did come in on, on an on-call situation and you wanted to sit your patient on the edge of the bed or sit them out of bed, which isn't unusual for cardiac, um, on an on-call situation, I suppose it should be written in the notes or it's, you know, on the chart, but just to make sure that they've not just had a balloon pump out, it's unlikely, I would say, um, but it's probably just, just worth checking before you start swinging the legs out of bed and getting them jigging about if they're meant to still be on bed rest. Um, it should be pretty obvious, I'd imagine, but it's worth considering. Um, you can see it on a chest x-ray if you've got really good eyes. There's a little arrow to it there. Not that we'd be looking for it, but they will check to see if it's in the right place. Because obviously it just should be sat in your descending aorta, which must be just there. <laughs> um, what's, what time am I on, Jenny? Just give me a time check. Oh crikey, okay, that's fine. I knew I'd talk a lot of nonsense. Um, pulmonary artery catheters, or swan gans, named after the man who invented them, I believe. Unlike your balloon pump, your balloon pump is an intervention. Your pulmonary artery catheter is a, a measuring device. It's a, another monitoring tool, um, which you'll see on cardiac. It's a um, specialised catheter with four lumens and it's used to measure and assess, monitor and assess heart function. Um, again, we don't really need to know the ins and outs of all of this. Um, the main thing for us is that, again, they're not able to mobilise with this line in situ. Um, there's no restriction on sitting up in the bed. They can sit up um, as, as, you know, as high as, as they need to. But you just can't mobilize so you can't sit on the edge of the bed at this moment you know at the moment we are looking into evidence around this but as it stands at the moment no sitting on the edge of the bed no mobilizing out of bed um i'll just flick and show you the picture and i'll flip back the reason for this is just because of the placement of it so it's inserted into into a neckline in the superior vena cava and it goes into the right side of the heart through the right atrium through the right ventricle and sits in the pulmonary artery. Um, and there's a little balloon that when they take the measurements, they'll inflate in there. The risk is that if you move a patient and obviously end up pulling the line back, that it, it could be pulled back. And instead of sitting in the pulmonary artery, it could be it could sit in the right ventricle and essentially be flapping around in the, in the right ventricle, which is really high risk for causing um, cardiac arrhythmias and sort of nasty VFs and VTs, I think. Um, so as it stands at the moment, it's a bit of a pain for us um, because we can't mobilize with them. What it does um, sort of briefly is it measures different cardiac values, which again, we don't really need to get our head around. It's just another thing to look at. So the little table here shows you some of the values and the ones that we're really interested in are the cardiac index and the systemic vascular resistance index. Essentially, these are components of blood pressure, aren't they? So blood pressure obviously is a gross measure of, of, of your blood pressure. Whereas if, so, say for instance, um, someone's blood pressure is low, instead of the nurses or the doctors just sort of blindly going in and increasing one of the drugs, this will just give them that little bit more information about what's, what component of the blood pressure is failing in terms of why is the blood pressure low. So my simple brain works that, you know, if cardiac, in, so cardiac output, um, and systemic vascular resistance they are obviously figures whereas the indices the cardiac index and the systemic vascular resistance index is more specific to body surface area so obviously um you know little doris is going to have a completely different cardiac output to you know a big wrestling man <laughs> those two people i compared them had um so we look at the cardiac index and the systemic vascular resistance index rather than just the gross measures um, essentially, if your cardiac index is low, then that shows that you've got a contractility problem and you, you're not able to, your heart's not pumping as well as it should do. So they'll increase a drug to help with um, contractility. So they'll increase adrenaline, for instance. Or if your systemic vascular resistance is low, that means your vessels aren't sort of 
um, squeezed enough and they're floppy and dilated, so they'll want to increase a vasoconstrictor, so they'll increase noradrenaline. Again, it doesn't really matter to us. We're not faffing with the drugs. I suppose it's just if you come along and you want to, you're thinking in, about doing a positive pressure treatment or doing some sort of treatment with a patient and you're trying to get a, an idea about how cardiovascularly stable they are, if someone's got studies from a PA catheter and they are written on the ICU chart, having, even if you can't remember, these, they are written on the back of the chart as well. as well. These, you don't have to remember the normal values. You know, if you come along and you're trying to work out, actually, oh, this patient's got a PA catheter. I actually really want to bird them. You know, they can't mobilize. I'm really limited with my treatments. Maybe I want to bird them and do some um, secretion clearance with them in the bed. I'm a bit unsure about whether I want to bird them or not. And the blood pressure's borderline, and you're, again, this is just another, another, another thing that you can look at to try and establish actually how cardiovascular stable are they? You know, if their cardiac index and their systemic vascular resistance index are well within range and actually, you know, they're looking really good, then probably you can, you know, again, with discussion with the MDT, you probably can go ahead and do something. Whereas actually, if they're only just within the normal range or not quite in the normal range and they're going up on the um, cardiovascular drugs, probably at that point, you're going to think, oh, I'm not sure, you know, do I need to have more discussion? How, you know, how important is it that I do something? So don't get too sort of caught up in them. I'm, we're not expecting you to remember them um, or even fully understand them. I think if you can just, even if you come in and someone had a PA catheter, just to think, oh, they've got that weird yellow line in the neck that I've not seen before. And I'm just going to stand and have a minute and chat to the bedside nurse and she'll be able to tell me how cardiovascular stable they are. Um, it's just so that you don't think, oh my God, what is this? Um, quickly then, so what are the main problems that patients have post cardiac surgery? So the stuff that you're going to get sort of called into generally, the nurses are brilliant on there and they, they are really good at sort of escalating stuff themselves and managing stuff themselves. You know, I don't want to don't want to take credit away from physios, but they really do do a good job at doing the basic physio. Um, so I would say if they are calling you in on cardiac, generally it's because they've done a lot of the stuff themselves. You know, they have, um, it's not, it's, it's not um, unusual for them to have already mobilized the patient themselves and sort of gone through deep breathing and things. So um, one of the, probably the biggest things we get is obviously post-op pain from stenotomy or drains. And often this leads to um, reduced ability to deep breathe and cough leading to basal collapse um, and often the left base. Um, main things we're going to treat with obviously we've harped on haven't we about early mobilization and um, day one if possible pretty much always unless there's something in place that's stopping us from mobilizing um, if this is causing type 1 respiratory failure and we're actually hypoxic then obviously making sure we're optimizing our oxygen requirements and we are quite quick to add CPAP in I'd say on, on cardiac sort of um, even if we've not necessarily got a need for it on our ABG, they are often quite keen to add CPAP in just to get that peep really to increase our FRC um, and to sort of prevent patients getting any worse. Um, and obviously, if we've got something that's focal from a lobular collapse perspective that isn't improving with sort of our standard CPAP and mobilising, then again, we do often add in sort of the bird, so IPPB fairly early on. Again, Often our patients are um, sort of in the category of being alert and awake and, you know, probably a varying degrees of um, compliance, but, you know, they are the type of patient that are cognitively um, intact. So we often try to add in um, the bird sort of fairly early on to give them a bit of autonomy over um, sort of their treatment. Um, if secretion clearance is an issue which again is often associated with pain um, and certainly if the drains haven't come out day one they often um, cause us problems just making sure that um, analgesia is optimized really so normal analgesia is um, regular paracetamol with PRN dihydrocodeine and morphine but if this isn't if, you know if this isn't enough then that's okay and I think often we are the first people to spot that it isn't enough and to get getting get in touch with the doctors and get them to add something additional in um, the nurses often have already done it but not always but making sure that if they need one which most of our patients do have a rolled up towel um, for supported cough over the stenotomy site 
Um, and again, not that we've got full control of it, but often if pain is improved, our secretion clearance does tend to improve. Um, pain is normally a big source of our, our problems. Um, Contraindications and cautions then. We've, this is all stuff we have talked about, but it's just probably a bit more of a summary. Um, I said earlier about patients being sort of higher risk for pneumothoraces following drain removal. Um, so sometimes when they take the drain out, um, there is an air leak, so you will find that there is a pneumothorax. Sometimes they're small um, and they're not massively clinically significant and they don't need draining. But I suppose it's just before we go sort of gung-ho with any CPAP or um, positive pressure or any bird or anything, it's worth just always checking the chest x-ray. Um, and again, if you're not sure, get someone to check it with you. Um, and again, patients can develop um, arrhythmias post-op. And again, it's just making sure that um, you're happy before you do anything from a treatment perspective. Often the medics are happy for, to do stuff. I would say, I think probably we're more cautious probably than the medics are. Um, you know, sometimes we'll maybe hold back and think well, we shouldn't be doing something. But again, it's just having a conversation um, and making sure that they're happy for us to go ahead with whatever we're going to do. Balloon pump we've said about, haven't we? Um, unable to mobilise when they've got it in situ. Um, and again, it's just six hours really until they can do something um, after it's come out. Um, and again, we said about pulmonary artery catheter. So the difference with the, the pulmonary artery catheter coming out is that um, unlike the balloon pump, we can mobilise them fairly quickly afterwards. There's, there's no time limit on that at all. Um, it's just like taking any other sort of line out. Um, they, can, they can get out really sort of within 30 minutes. Um, and chest drains again everybody will I'm sure will have come across chest drains at some point but um, obviously these don't restrict us necessarily from mobilising we encourage patients to mobilise with the chest drains in um, just need to keep them below the level of insertion site so obviously we're not getting any backflow um, obviously then better to, nicer to mobilise without them in a couple of scenarios then just before we finish um, there's a patient that is post-op day two um, and they've not been seen on the Friday or the, well, it says they've not been seen by physio on the Friday um, deemed as low risk for developing post-op pulmonary complications. Um, so it's not that they haven't been seen, I suppose they've been screened and they've been identified as not requiring any further intervention. Um, however, the deteriorated and they're now on 60% um, high flow face mask. The nurses have been pretty good. They've already sat them out in the chair. Um, there is evidence of collapse on the chest X-ray. They've got a reasonable blood pressure, but they're on a little bit of noradrenaline and a little bit of dopamine, so two of our sort of cardiovascular drugs. Um, so not, but not much at all. Um, and you call to see the patient by the registrar. So treatment that we're going to consider for this patient. So oxygen therapy. They're clearly on sixty percent already. So I suppose the main first thing is. They're receiving a high flow of oxygen so is it humidified so just making sure that the humidifier is turned on um being a bit of a funny order but probably at this point they're on 60 percent oxygen aren't they so we probably want to think about um obviously we've not got any gases or any sats here but you know what is their oxygenation like on that level of oxygen and actually do we need to think about adding in some peep um because if they're not meeting their um target PO2 and target SATs, then we can keep going up and up and up on the oxygen, can't we? But if we're not actually getting efficient, sufficient gas exchange, then we're not gonna, we're not gonna improve um, our oxygenation. So adding in a bit of PEEP, sort of um, increasing our FRC, giving ourselves be, you know, better VQ and better surface area for actually getting that gas exchange. Um, again, we often add in CPAP quite quickly. We know that they've got collapse on the x-ray, so CPAP's gonna help with that and whether or not our patient could tolerate IPPB. So we're not gonna go into IPPB, but probably the patient could pro probably do a bit of IPPB, couldn't they? They're on 60% oxygen. Could we get them on a high flow nasal cannula whilst we do the bird with them? Um, we know the bird gives 40% oxygen, so we're not far off. Or could we do the bird and then quickly keep popping them back on their oxygen? Um, and then CPAP afterwards 
um, any volume that we've we've gained from doing the bird is often um, maintained with a bit of CPAP. Um, and again, not sure how they'll manage, but could you know they're already out in the chair? Could they do some mobilising on the spot? Could we go through some um, deep breathing whilst they're mobilising um, to try and recruit any volume? And it says, is there an issue with issue with secretions? So we don't know, do we? But we could probably assess, you know, what is their cough like? Um, do they sound productive? Again, the bird will help with secretion clearance. I think people often think the bird is just a volume, but it certainly helps with secretion clearance as well. Just the second one, um, post-op day three following um, an AVR, so an aortic valve replacement. COPD, recent chest infection, struggling to clear secretions with a wet cough. And we do have stats here, we've got stats of 93 on three litres of oxygen, and we know the COPD and a smoker. Um, so I suppose the main thing is, why are they struggling to clear secretion? So going back to what we know about the problems with cardiac surgery patients, have, you know, what is their pain like? Have they had adequate, adequate analgesia? Often, you know, when they come around with their analgesia, they'll say, you know, have you, have you got any pain? And they'll say, no, no, but actually, no one's actually challenged them and got them to cough, got them to deep breathe, got them to move. You know, they've been sat, you know, like a sack of spuds in the chair for two hours and probably the, the most they've had to do is have a drink. So um, often we are the people when we come along and we challenge them and we say, right, you know, do a big cough for us. That's when we discover that the pain isn't well managed, well managed at all. Um, is it, assess, is it affecting lung volumes and or oxygenation? So, you know, we want to auscultate, don't we? Maybe have look at the latest chest x-ray. Um, what, you know, the fact that they've got secretions, yes, the, the cough sounds wet, but, you know, what, what does that mean? Have they, have they got areas of um, plugging off possibly, you know, or are they at risk of? Um, and I suppose what's their normal oxygen levels they're a patient who we know has got COPD who's a smoker they've got stats of 93 is that normal for them you know doing to start chasing stats of 95 96 so the good thing about the cardiac patients is that certainly if they're elective or acute they'll always have pre-op um, observations on the ward so they'll always have um, a pre-op news pre-op chest x-ray pre-op pre blood so it's always just nice to be able to compare back to um, and again, have you know they've talked about a recent chest infection and they've now got a wet cough. What have they got um, any signs of infection? So checking the blood results. What would you consider as part of your management plan? So um, analgesia to address any pain. So liaising with the medical staff or the, you know the, nurse, the bedside nurse. Often they've got some stuff waiting in the wings to be given sort of PRN if they need it. Um, oxygen therapy. So once you've established whether they've whether they're in with the, whether they're within their target range um, of oxygen saturations, you know, do they need to escalate into some sort of even just low flow oxygen or high flow oxygen? And would a bit of it says at the bottom, but would would any humidification help as well? They've got a wet cough, but probably they're struggling to clear it, aren't they? So some humidification, nebulizers if they're not already written up for it, and mucolytics. Often we we get the medics to prescribe carbocysteine. It's not going to work instantly, but it's worth giving a go, um, certainly if they're going to be with us for a little while. Um, positioning, again, so thinking about the best position for cough effectiveness. If they haven't got one already, a support, um, a towel for supported cough. Um, and again, like with everything, consider IPPB on cardiac. <laughs> Seems to be the recurring theme. Um, and checking the chest x-ray, like we said. And I suppose just specifically for this patient noting that they're COPD and just to check for any um any bull eye which again should have been noted they're a cardiac surgical patient this is something that should have been considered pre-op so um just have a check but it should be clear really if it has um if they do have and just checking again if they've been restarted on their normal inhalers um normally they just withheld withheld them um sort of as they're still sedated and ventilated, but obviously once they're awake in this patient's post-op day three now, so hopefully someone should have restarted them on their normal inhalers if, if they're on sort of um, regular stuff.
and last one, oh, this one's all coming up like this. Um, last one is a post at day one patient who has had an acute cabbage who as the reason why they've needed that is because they had um, an end stemi three days ago. They're a little bit poorlier. They've got a balloon pump in um, because they couldn't come off bypass successfully. They had some problems. They've got the swan gun, so the peer catheter in, so the catheter that's monitoring all the studies that sat in the pulmonary artery. Um, they've got a cardiac index of 1.8, which I'm not expecting you to remember the normal values, but that's pretty low. So our normal um, cardiac index is 2.5 to 3.5, so that's quite low. Our systemic vascular resistance index, again, just within the cusp of the range, just on the lower border. They're elite positive. Um, they're on a couple of um, inotropes. They've got a reasonable-ish blood pressure and they are intubated and they're on a ventilated mode. So they're on um, PRVC. So they've got a, a set tidal volume and PEEP and they're on 50%. So probably the first thing is that they've got a balloon pump in, haven't they? So they're definitely, you know, and their cardiac index is low. So they've got a low cardiac output for their body surface area. So they've definitely got a low cardiac output state, whether they've got some left ventricular failure or they're sort of in cardiogenic shock. Um, often cardiac insufficiency can affect oxygenation as well as another thing to consider. Um, I suppose things that might influence, well, things that might influence our physio management again is just the cautious use of positive pressure. So, again, it's not a complete no no, it's just the risk versus benefit. And I think trying to identify what this patient's physio, amen physio amenable problems are and how important that is in the state of play, again, is a discussion with the medical team, really. So, I feel like we've probably just said a lot of the same stuff, but I suppose the reoccurring theme here is there sort of isn't a real right and wrong answer. And even working on, on the unit sort of day to day, I would always seek sort of support and advice from the MDT really to sort of come to a bit of a joint decision. Um, because each patient's different and every, each patient has different problems and different needs really. Um, I feel like we've massively flicked through that. Um, there's lots and lots of information there. Um, so don't worry if that feels like it's just been an absolute whirlwind. Um, but if, you, if you're listening and you have no clue what I've talked about, then drop me an email and um, you can come and spend some time with me on cardiac to do, even if it's just to chat through some stuff specifically or see some patients or just have a look at some of the stuff. Um, I would really like to, yeah to support me to do some shadowing. So um, please get in touch.